it's been a tough couple of months. So we're taking a break on this homemade edition of Showcase and looking at comedy in the past, present and future. Okay, let's begin with The Golden Age of Comedy, a compilation of silent films from 1957 that pulled comedic legends Laurel and Hardy out of obscurity. We're joined by Andrew Horton, author of the book Laughing Out Loud. Hi Andrew, so um, let me start off this way. We still talk about these movies. But I just wonder if if this is something like we're just looking for a nostalgic moment or do they really have something timeless and valuable and relevant still? Comedy, the, the great golden age silent comedians, we're talking Charlie Chaplin, uh, you know, everybody back then. Uh, it works. I teach a class in global film comedy, 17 weeks, 17 countries, because every country has a sense of humor that helps them in troubles. We're in trouble in America today. I'm finding young people watching old comedies, they're touched and they say, watching Buster Keaton, watching the Marx Brothers, this helps us with what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. It's always been part of uh, humanity. Uh, Go back to Aristophanes in ancient Greece, Lysistrata. They are at war. Women go on a sex strike and they stop the war. Great play, great comedy. Did it stop the war? No, but it helped. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's just talk about these uh, golden age um, movies. I mean, do you, okay, first of all, what was their relationship with the concept of authority? Were they like making nonsense out of authority? Because just because you mentioned, um, today's troubled times. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, so much of the early film comedy, uh, Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, even the Marx Brothers, they came out of vaudeville. Vaudeville was traveling theater, mm -hmm. traveling theater around the world. But in America, you're going from town to town. You get up in the evening, you sing, you tell jokes, People are in trouble. There was the Depression. There was World War One. Then there was World War Two, and this was a way to help people get beyond what they were dealing with. Uh, and uh, some of it became romantic comedy. You're looking for somebody to live with. But some of it became anarchistic comedy, like the Marx Brothers, where you can make fun of anything. Hmm. Uh, and that helped them deal with hard times uh, throughout. So Chaplin, for instance, uh, what was his character? He played the tramp. He had no money. He had no real job. He was looking for love. He, and he could make you laugh uh, by physical things, slapstick, all of that. But at the end of most Chaplin films, he's alone again walking down the road. Uh, and that's touching. That's not funny. Mm -hmm. But that tells you about the times and it tells you about humanity and the real world. So do you think that Hollywood uh, consciously tried to help people psychologically during the World War II? Because we see a lot of enduring comedies coming out of that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I don't think they're saying psychologically, they're saying people need to laugh. And these people have traveled America and done it without film. And then, hey, now we have something called cinema. Let's do the same thing. Okay. Let's make people laugh. And of course, silent comedy worked around the world. You didn't need subtitles for Charlie Chaplin if you were living in Bolivia or if you were living in Russia or wherever you were living, uh, you could appreciate silent comedy. Mm -hmm. And how did people respond to these kind of movies back then? Uh, again, they were so popular uh, that, you know, uh, they became influenced everybody around mm. the world because uh, and and the physical things we've all grown up with uh, trying to do funny things throw a pie in your face ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and, and uh, you know so this is something that even children it works for all ages it works for children it works for adults uh, and today seeing them my grandsons love seeing these films but the older people like them too. Brings back memories. Mm -hmm. 
So they actually were more accessible compared to today's comedies. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you don't need subtitles. I mean, uh, I love uh, uh, films by Preston Sturges, Sullivan's Travels and so forth, but you need subtitles so you can understand what they're saying. Okay, so give me some recommendations because I don't necessarily know, you know, a lot of uh, these kind of movies. Yes, okay. Well, okay, let's just start again. Let's say, Chaplin, I recommend you go see... Uh, uh, modern times 1936 mm -hmm. uh, and that he takes he was already so famous but he changed it in that sense because he uh, falls in love uh, and at the end he and she are walking down the road so it's a, it gives a romantic ending mm -hmm. Buster Keaton Sherlock Jr. is a film he plays the projectionist in a movie theater who's trying to fall in love but he doesn't understand love but he watches the movie he's showing and he gets ideas in the movie they're kissing, so he turns around and kisses the girl. So he's <laughs> learning from movies and everyone is laughing. That's one. Marx Brothers, you've got these three crazy, actually six, but three crazy brothers doing anything they wanna do. They make up whatever they wanna do. That's what you call anarchistic comedy. With Marx Brothers, you're not expecting logic and everything. They make up a country that doesn't exist and they do everything. That's fun. And that gives you that freedom in your soul to say, I'd like to do that too. Uh, then we're moving into uh, the sound era and uh, you start to get people like Frank Capra. Uh, he was a director of films like It Happened in One Night. And then uh, you're talking about Preston Sturges, who I loved. Sullivan's Travels, I'm recommending. Sullivan's Travels is about a Hollywood, uh, made in the early 40s. Uh, about a Hollywood director of comedy who feels America's in trouble, so he must make a serious film called Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Mm -hmm. Now, if you hear that title, you know the Coen brothers stole the title and they winked to Preston Sturges. In his film, Sullivan's Travels, this director of comedy goes into hard times and sees people suffering all over America. And he changes his life when, with these poor people in a church, they show a comedy and everyone laughs. So he said, you know what? I have to go back to Hollywood and make comedies. <laughs> so that is so good. But I'm going to push just a little bit further and say, push into uh, a little bit later into the 60s. And I did a book on George Roy Hill. He did Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. I got to know Paul Newman and Robert Redford. Mm -hmm. And they were able to make everybody laugh. Everybody in the world watches comedy, uh, watches cowboy movies. So you do a cowboy comedy based on true people people were laughing. So many good recommendations, thank you. Uh, but I just want to find out something. I mean, are these the kind of comedic productions you watch these days? Do you follow any sort of uh, contemporaries? What's happening uh, with the hard times the world is in, people are writing advances of ideas of what to stream. So many things are streaming online around the world. And this is actually I'm very touched that uh, people can now see the comedies they couldn't usually see. And I get my former students in touch with me around the world. And they say, oh my God, we're watching more Buster Keaton, we're watching this. You people around the world, you can go online now and you can see so many wonderful films. And they touch you now because so many of them are, are reflecting hard times and we need to know that people can survive. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, lots of good information. Thank you so much. Our time is up, unfortunately. Keep laughing. <laughs> Thank you. So, how did we get from Laurel and Hardy to Blues Brothers and Airplane? two movies that are celebrating their 40th anniversaries this year. So, Ethan Desaif is here to explain. He lectures about communications at Sonoma State University. So, Ethan, hi, good to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, you're welcome. So, I'm just a little bit confused about this. When I say modern comedy, <clears throat> what exactly does, this, does that mean? Is there a consensus on when modern comedy started and, uh, you know, what was the, you know, sort of the movie that turned the history of comedy around? Is there such a thing? 
I don't think there is such a thing. Uh, I don't think there is such a thing as a movie that turned anything around, and I don't really even think there is such a thing as modern comedy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not even sure what the term really entails. Uh, maybe I could imagine it being some sort of thing where people point to sort of a postmodern gesture in comedies, modern comedy, something like, mm -hmm. say, a, a Deadpool movie, where this sort of like, a, uh, uh, you know, one of, one of the little uh, get it, get it, get it, ironic, breaking the fourth wall sort of stuff. But that's very old, very, mm -hmm. very old stuff. Um, I mean, that goes back, well, I should, I should pause here and say that the, the context for me that helps to explain a lot of at least American comedy is one that Henry Jenkins, uh, a, a scholar who's at MIT, he, he wrote a book called, um, uh, oh my God, um, What Made Pistachio Nuts? Mm -hmm. And it's about um, the, the so-called vaudeville aesthetic in American comedy. Okay. And the, the vaudeville tradition, I think, explains a lot of it. And a lot of the seeds of what became American film comedy started on the vaudeville stage at, in the uh, 19th and early 20th centuries. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for example, Vulture, uh, this online culture website, says that, uh, I mean, one writer from Vulture, Richard Pryor, uh, says that Richard Pryor modernized uh, comedy. And they say that it happened in 1979, the comedian was Richard Pryor and the event was the release of the motion picture Richard Pryor live in concert. Sure. I mean, in that sense, when I assume I haven't read the article, but I assume that what he was talking about was that um, Richard Pryor brought comedy into the modern moment and made it about social issues, racial issues, um, things that mattered to people who weren't just um, white people chuckling sensibly at, uh, you know, the antics of someone on stage. But he, you know, Pryor, who I is unbelievably important, probably one of the two or three most important comedians of the 20th century. Um, he started talking about what we might call something real. You know, mm. it wasn't just fantastical stuff. It was more about uh, social and political issues. And I assume that's what that article meant by modernizing. Okay, so, I mean, we started off by mentioning the Blues Brothers and Airplane. So, will you talk us through the importance of these movies in uh, the history of comedy? Because, I mean, obviously they were feeding off of the golden age humor of Hollywood, but then they brought an edge to it. So, why don't you talk us through that? Sure. Um, in, in many ways, I think both of these films are quite old-fashioned. Uh, I, I, the Blues Brothers... Um, is a film that I, I have to admit, though I've seen it in my adult film scholar life, I haven't seen it in a long time. And I have never been particularly impressed with the Blues Brothers, and I don't, I sort of don't understand the, the cult for it. Um, to me, it's not particularly funny, and I think that some of its um, social and racial attitudes don't play particularly well anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of wincing, wincingly bad, as a matter of fact. Um, but it's important in an industrial sense because it was one of the first, if not the first, films to spin off from Saturday Night Live, which is, of course, an all-important force in American comedy since 1977, I think it was. Hmm. Um, the, the strange thing about Saturday Night Live is that, you know, it presented itself as this, as this thing where, oh, the cutting edge, uh, the, the radical new comedy and we're going to show it at midnight and it's going to be crazy and it's not your father's comedy. Um, and it was sort of like that for its first season, but very soon after it became the definition of mainstream comedy, you know? Yeah. And so it, it branched out into, um, into cinema uh, quite easily. And so the Blues Brothers was the, I think it was the very first movie to be spun off from a, from an SNL skit. Mm -hmm. And as such, it showed the commercial viability of SNL. And of course, you know, people from that show have dominated American comedy since that time, not just in movies that spun off from the show, but um, in, in their own vehicles. You know, someone like Will Ferrell, you know, who's an enormous comedy star, started there. Or, I mean, Eddie Murphy, a million, a million people. Mm -hmm. So it has a certain uh, very important place in industrial history, I think. Okay, so, I mean, obviously comedies can... They do play with stereotypes, but sometimes whilst doing that, they can reinforce those stereotypes. What do you think? I mean, let's just focus on these two movies uh, for the time being, as it can get a bit confusing for people who are not familiar. 
Uh, sure. So the Blues Brothers and Airplane, how do you think they played out uh, with uh, you know these stereotypes and whether they sort of reinforced them? Um, so to go back to your example of, of Richard Pryor, right? Richard Pryor, one of his his MOs was to turn stereotypes, specifically racial stereotypes, on their heads. Um, movies like Airplane and uh, and the Blues Brothers don't do that. They accept them, and they might make them a little bit ironic, but they basically still operate on the same mm -hmm. uh, on, on the same with the same stereotypes. It's just like it's a little bit of a postmodern gesture, I suppose, to say like, "Hey, there's this stereotype, and we're going to do it." But once again, yeah. get it? We're playing with a stereotype. So, but Pryor, for instance, went much further by showing that those stereotypes were invalid and harmful mm -hmm. in, in the course of, of nevertheless telling jokes. So, so that's what I think that might mean. Um, and that's true. It's far more true of the Blues Brothers than it is of Airplane, though. I, I, I've seen Airplane a million times, though, again, not for, not for a little while. But um, that one definitely has some racial and gender issues that probably don't play particularly well, but are a little less, I would say, painful because it's so damn silly. The whole thing is silly from start to finish. Uh, I, I say this, of course, as a white guy, so I don't really know, but my guess is be, would be that the sting from that one is probably a little less harsh. Okay, well, this is really interesting, but unfortunately, this is all the time we have. Ethan, this life, good to have you on our show today. Thanks. Oh, sure, you're welcome. So, riots across America and a pandemic plaguing the world. It's hard to find something to laugh about these days. But will comedies need to change? I wanted to ask Celestino Deleto, who teaches film and English literature at the University of Zaragoza. Hi, Celestino. Hello. So, How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much. I have a lot of questions prepared for you. So okay. let's, let's just Fire start away. off. <laughs> let's just start off with this. Some people say that there hasn't been great comedies recently. And one is one such person is Ali John, my producer. What do you think about this? Okay. Do you agree? Uh, well, if we if we're talking about a traditional cinema, if we're talking about films on the big screen, I would probably tend to agree. Mm -hmm. I think I think the cinema hasn't produced all that many wonderful comedies, and especially if we, if we talk about uh, American comedy. Okay. Uh, maybe in other parts of the world there have been great comedies. In fact, if I may say so, I would say that the the Korean film, the South Korean film that won the Oscar uh, this year, mm -hmm. uh, Parasite, for me it's a comedy it's at least partly a comedy so that's a great comedy mm -hmm. but other than that i think most uh, great comedy is being produced on the uh, platforms really on the audiovisual platforms like netflix hbo amazon etc and why do you think that is probably uh, because the at least partly because the best writers the best comedy writers uh, and also the best actors are being hired by the platforms rather than than the, the traditional Hollywood studios. Maybe that's part of the reason. So it's not really exclusive to comedy, but uh, it's just the, the state of uh, the industry at the moment. Exactly, mm. exactly. So I don't think, I actually don't think that there has been any period in history where uh, comedy hasn't produced great masterworks. The comic spirit and the comic impulse is always very much there. And if it will always find a channel of expression. So whether it is in Hollywood or whether it is uh, on, telev on traditional television or on the platforms or indeed uh, around the world, as I say, comedy will out, will always mm. be there, I think. It, it actually, it's really interesting to hear you say that the non-American comedy is thriving these days. I mean, you gave the example of Parasite. Uh, that's a really interesting topic, but we're, today we're focusing more or less uh, on American comedy. So uh, okay. I wonder, okay, you said that there are not really great comedies anymore in American cinema. So what was, what is the last great American comedy you remember? Uh, okay, 
I love the uh, the before trilogy, the Richard Linklater films. Uh, the first one was 1995, before Sunrise. Then we we had Before Sunset in 2004, and then we had Before Midnight, 2013. Uh, to me, those are great comedies, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's it's a trilogy so far. There are three films there, so that would be my my off the top of my head answer. Okay, so, uh, so one argument, one interesting argument is that uh, comedies are dramedies now. So I want to hear what you have to say about this. Do you really draw a line between a regular classic idea of a comedy and a dramedy? Because sounds like you're really uh, defining comedy in a more like broad sense, uh, you know, seeing Parasite okay. as comedy. Uh... Yeah, I would say that in, this, in the history of, of uh, let's say, cinematic comedy, there have been, uh, let's say, purer comedies. But in general, I think uh, uh, I'm all for hybridity. I think comedy has always mixed with other genres. So whether we call them uh, dramedies or whether you call them uh, comic adventure films or whether we call them even, I don't know, uh, uh, comic horrors, Comedy is always there, so it's, I don't think it's, it is that unusual that comedy mixes with other genres as with drama. But yes, I think in, in American in American cinema lately and, and uh, television series and platforms, there is a regular combination of mm. comedy and drama. And do we have this hybrid form of comedy a lot more uh, recently? I'm not sure. No, I don't. I would, uh, um, as I say, I would have to think about the other top mm -hmm. of my head. I don't think there is such a great difference between the co the, the mixture of genres that we get nowadays and, and what we got in the 1970s or in the 1960s or the 1920s, for that matter. Mm -hmm. If you think, for example, about the films, the great silent uh, comics like Charles Chaplin and Buster Keaton, those were always, always mixtures of drama and comedy so there's nothing new under the sun there okay it's just a matter of looking at things i guess so i want to just move on to another uh point when i was given this task i was just thinking about humor today uh, and you know what it really represents and what kind of a state it's in and then i just thought about the political correctness uh issues surrounding the industry at the moment i mean we see a lot of uh stand-ups being held to account for uh, you know, uh, they are problematic jokes per se. So I wonder what you have to say about this. Do you think that we have to balance freedom of speech with um, social responsibility in humor? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I think uh, I, I actually think that comedy has always been uh, socially responsible and uh, socially conscious, and uh, in fact, some of the best comedy in the in the in history, both in and outside the cinema, has been a, a, a very socially uh, conscious. Uh, which doesn't mean to say politically correct. I mm. think uh, comedy is uh, almost by definition iconoclastic, and therefore it is going to. Uh, uh, more or less automatically go against the uh, against social rules, against social conventions. And I'm afraid nowadays one area of, of social conventions that is very strong is political correctness, whether in terms of uh, gender or race or ethnic group, etc. So comedy, you're always going to have comedy uh, uh, making fun of that, w w which doesn't mean that it's not socially responsible. I think I think there is a, 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 a difference there. So co uh, comedy. Uh, satire, which is a form of comedy, is a form of comedy which is always uh, striving for a better world, for a for a, for, for a fairer world, for a world in which there is no hypocrisy, etc. And that is iconoclastic. It is always going to go against the the uh, the received rules of society. Okay, so what are you watching these days? I am watching, um, at the moment, I am watching another uh, series, another uh, uh, well, television series which is on the platform, on the platforms, which is called uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Okay. And this is, this is a sitcom kind of comedy, which 
Uh, also shows, if I may say, uh, another characteristic of comedy, which is its ambivalence. So uh, it's, 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 it's a series about uh, 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 the police, about the, the New York police, uh, mm -hmm. Brooklyn uh, police station. And this, uh, this comedy is hilarious. The humor, the writing is excellent. And it both, it both uh, laughs at the institutions, in this case, the police, and also celebrates the police. So comedy is both it's both critical and mm -hmm. celebratory, and I think this this uh, series exemplifies this beautifully. Yeah, uh, hilarious comedy, a great thing to watch in the times of coronavirus. Yeah, huge Jack Peralta fan here. So let's do there it later. You go. There you yeah. go. <laughs> it was good to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. That's it for Showcase, I'm Elif Bereketli. Remember, we're on YouTube, Instagram and Twitter. Until then, keep washing your hands.